Hi everybody, I'm Andrew Bennett. Um, I teach robotics at Olin College of Engineering. Before that, I was the head of research at iRobot for about seven years. So that's where I know Scotty from and the folks here. So I'm currently working on a bunch of different projects and the one I'm gonna talk about tonight, we call SnotBot for what will become really obvious reasons. This is meant for a broader audience, so maybe some of this will feel like you already knew that, so just bear with me. So what is SnotBot's mission? Our job is to collect biological samples of whale blow. So why do you want biological samples of whale blow at all? Well, I can tell you it's not for any aesthetic reason whatsoever. 30 yards downwind of a whale when he blows and you're already gagging. The closer you get, the worse it gets. <laughs> so, but every time a whale blows, that big spout of water that you see is not water. It's actually coming from the lung of the whale. It's mucus, it's shed skin or shed lung samples, it's hormonal information. It is almost as good as a blood sample. So you get what you want from the whale if you can catch that before it hits the water again. It's just like a blood sample, but you never touch the whale, which is a win-win because for one reason, um, taking blood samples from whales is a non-trivial thing to do, if you can do it at all, which is nearly impossible. Even getting a blubber sample requires a specialized arrow and a specialized crossbow, and the failure rate is very, very high. It just bounces right off the skin. So, but they keep trying. And even if you do succeed, the law mandates that you can only collect four samples a year, or rather, you can attempt four samples a year from each specific whale, and that's the catch. First of all, if the whale in any way changes its behavior while you approach it, that counts and you can't take your sample. Secondly, you have to uniquely prove that that is the same whale that you saw a different time, so that you can uniquely prove whether or not you took more than four samples from a given whale which is nearly impossible. They have big books where they look at the tails when they dive and they try to catalog it. But once it dives, how do you prove that it's the same whale that came back up again when there's several whales? At the end of the day, they consider it a huge win when they get nine samples in one year. So it just doesn't work. But we can collect the snot. There's no rules about how much snot we collect because we didn't touch the whale. So you can have a sample from every whale in the pod if you feel like it and no one objects. Well, almost. The FAA objects if you fly higher than 400 feet and the fisheries department objects if you fly a lower than 1,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of our samples come from 200 miles off the coast of you know, California, you know, Gulf of Mexico, places like that. But the conventional method, it's hard to see, is a 40-foot pole with a piece of mesh on the end of it, and you lean way out from the boat, and you hope to nail it before the whale swims away. Uh, try to catch the blow. The success rate is pathetic. Uh, another group, about five years ago, rigged an RC helicopter to collect whale blow. And it worked, except that it took their very best pilot. He could only do it once in a rare while, and it was nearly impossible to tell when you were in the right position to get the samples. They got like one sample, I think, out of the entire effort. But they did win the Ig Nobel Prize that year for collecting whale blow with a helicopter. <laughs> Why are we using robots to chase the whales? Uh, this isn't this typical dirty, dull, and dangerous robot mission. Um, although whale, whale stuff is actually really, really stinky, so maybe it does qualify for dirty. Um, it is not dull, it's very exciting working around the whales, and it's not terribly dangerous uh, playing with the vehicles, or playing with the equipment. So, but on the other hand, when you approach a whale, robots are not threatening. The whale seems to interpret it the same way they do seabirds. So when a whale is feeding, um, they blow what are called net bubbles. They basically swim in a circle, and they blow bubbles while they do it, and it creates a curtain of bubbles. A group of whales will do this as a team. And it creates a curtain of bubbles, and it causes all the bait fish to crowd to the center to get away from the bubbles. And then the whales come up from beneath, and they just grab a whole mouthful of fish at one pass. And of course, the fish don't want to be eaten, so they run away towards the surface where the seabirds are waiting. So wherever a whale starts feeding, you're going to see a lot of seabirds taking advantage of the situation. So whales are used to having birds around them constantly, and they seem to react to the air vehicle the same way. It's like, yeah, whatever. It's got nothing to do with me. I don't care. So what are we building? We're building a multi-rotor unmanned air vehicle right now. Um, it, it is pilot. No one's in it, but we have to pilot it. What we'd rather have is an autonomous air system. So it is not piloted, and it does, we just do high-level control. We pick goals, we pick high-level mission areas for it, but we do not fly it, because our ultimate goal is to hand this off to a marine biologist. More specifically, a sleep-deprived, seasick marine biologist who's been at sea for three weeks and really doesn't care. <laughs> so that is our target audience. So that's what we're looking for. We want something where the ship can carry the aircraft in a container outside the hull, and when the time comes, the biologist just pushes a few buttons, it wakes up, they watch the screen, they see what they want to see, they say, that's my whale, 
and the air vehicle knows what to do and it collects all the samples for them. So that's what we're aiming for. So what is a snot bot? Um, it is a multi-copter UAV, so it's mechanically simple, simpler than the helicopters. Um, so helicopters have a big advantage in takeoff and landing over a, um, over a multi-copter though. When you're very near to the deck and you're trying to land and you get a cross breeze, if you're a helicopter, you can change the pitch of the rotor disc without changing your body attitude. So you can compensate for wind and still keep your body true to the deck when you're trying to land. When you're a multi-copter and you get wind, you gotta tilt your whole body to compensate. Fine when you're this high up, not fine when you're that high off the deck. And we have had them blown sideways right off the deck of the ship um, because they just couldn't compensate and they were still too light to sit reliably on the deck and they just whoosh right off the edge. So we're working on better ways of, of catching these things. But they are mechanically simple. We seal all the electronics inside, and I'll get into more of that in a minute, and they're relatively easy to maintain. So it's an easier one to hand to a biologist who doesn't know what they're doing. What makes a Snotbot different from a regular multi-copter? And I brought a, a pretty classic flame wheel, uh, DJI Flame Wheel 550. So there's the regular one. Um, this wouldn't survive long in the ocean, although we have taken it out, and it came back, mostly. Um, we do things like this where we armor it up and all the electronics live inside. Our issue is we're trying to protect against the ocean environment. So we have salt water, we have salt in the air, we have extreme heat and cold because they take this to all over the world and they leave it out on the deck so it gets frozen, it gets roasted. Um, we have to be able to operate from any ship of convenience so there's no infrastructure guaranteed when we show up. Um, and even I can't read that what it says here. <laughs> um, and we have to be sterile, easily sterilized because we don't want to contaminate the sample we collect. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have to be able to survive the impact of a blow when the whale blow hits it. So we have to develop a relatively much more robust system than a typical multi-copter. So we're basically, uh, the mission is um, sanitize your robot, launch it from the mothership, fly over a moving whale, collect that blow before it hits the water, bring that back to the moving ship, re-sanitize the robot, and go out and do it again. So, so conceptually simple mission. Practically it's just a pain in the ass. Simplified, there we are, hanging out over our happy whale, controlling it from the ship. So this is the cartoon version that this is what I would show to like, you know, vice admirals and CEOs. The system components that we're using are in the hardware, we are using um, a ground control station, which is typically a laptop. Um, I recommend, by the way, there's a Panasonic Toughbook out there that has the most amazing screen, fully daylight readable, direct sunlight, and you can still see it in color what's going on. Best laptop we ever got. Um, we have that. We have a telemetry radio, which is typically just one of the standard uh, 3D robotics 900 megahertz radios. Um, we have a vision radio, which is a, uh, right now we're experimenting with the DJI Lightbridge, which is a wonderful radio. It does uh, 1080p at 30 hertz uh, video. If you're using DJI Autopilot, you can actually plug it in and plug your radio into the ground station. And then you can do all of your manual control as well as uh, video directly through only one radio. But there's a huge problem with the, with the DJI, which I'll circle back to. So we have to use the uh, Pixhawk instead. Um, then on the, um, that's on the ground. We have the, the receiver. We have the RC transmitter on the ground for manual control. And then on the <coughs> other side, we've got um, the Pixhawk autopilot, the other end of the data link, the other end of the video link, which is not here because the student stole it. Um, and I uh, can't read the rest of it. Um, vision, radio, RC receiver, the ca and a camera. We have a camera to help line up the robot over the whale. So the whole idea is when you're looking at it from an angle, it's really tough when you're 100 yards away to tell whether or not you're really over the whale. So we use the video at that point to, say, to, to do first person view to say, yeah, we're lined up, we're where we want to be. Ideally, the robot will use a different set of sensors as well as a camera and say, I'm at the altitude I want to be, I'm over the part of the whale I'm supposed to be, I'm good to go, I'll, I'll catch the next blow. And that's what we're aiming for. So what have we done so far? Um, we sealed everything inside the electronics. Um, we... Can you submerge that in water? Can you dump yeah, it? Yeah, we have actually landed, and I got, I'll see the video, we actually did a landing. We try not to submerge it. Um, we think it will survive but we'd rather not test that part. Um, the electronics are in the chassis. I'll talk about the batteries in a second. I should have brought the pictures, they're really funny. Uh, the motors have the standard lacquer on them to protect them. Um, we replaced the physical arm switch with a Hall effect sensor, so we just tap a, a, a magnet to the side to arm it. Um, we 
we started in the first generation to try and protect the motors, but the drag on the seals was just killing our runtime. And then one day a student pointed out, you know, we get these nice T motors for 24 bucks a pop. If we throw out one a year, what do we care? So we put all the motors on the outside and we just recognize that the bearings go. I think this is the, now this one's okay. We have another one with the bearings. You can really feel the bearings are pretty well gone. The corrosion's got to the bearings. When the bearings are finally too far gone, we just pull the cable out, we feed in a new one, we strap on a new motor, and we're back in business. So those motors aren't specially sealed in any way? No, no. It's, uh, it was, we were killing our runtime when we tried it. So we just, we're basically, we view the motors now as ablative. We just use them up like we do batteries. But you totally a certain couldn't number of flights. submerge it then because the motor would short out. No, no, it's a brushless. It'll survive. Yeah. I did a tail of the submarine once where we put the rotor directly mounted on the tail cone and the stator was down inside. Uh -huh. And on that one, the magnets were in the rotor, so it was just isolated and all the coils were on the other side and not a problem. So, But it will corrode. We can't stop that. Um, battery protection on this one, we use, um, we use condoms, zip ties, and monkey dunk. So condoms are condoms. Um, very important to get unlubricated because it just makes a hash of your battery otherwise. <laughs> Zip ties to seal the end of the condom around the wires, and monkey dung is a substance that's um, in um, ocean engineering, we call it monkey dung. Electricians have another name for it. It's a kind of a gray putty that you use when you have to seal around wires for external junction boxes. And it's a really great waterproofing material. It's extremely temperature tolerant. It'll reject anything. Uh, but once you work with it, it gets on your hands and it gets on everything. No matter how many times you try to clean your hands, it just smears more of this gray goo everywhere. So the nickname for it is monkey dung. You have to do the monkey dung, I suppose, every time you swap out the Every battery. time you swap out the batteries, yeah. So I've actually I've got videos of a couple of my students who are actually, you know, you know, you know giggling hysterically as they're, as they're busy opening up condos and wrapping up batteries and tying them up with zip ties. And, and they thought that was the funniest I mean, thing. So do you try and charge inductively so you don't have to cycle no, them? No, we pull them after every mission and just, I, I have an entire drawer in my lab full of nothing but condoms and monkey dung. <laughs> it's labeled too, which gets the best reactions out of students. It's like, that's not really, yes it is. It actually <laughs> says condoms, thumb screws, and monkey dung because we use thumb screws to seal the top. Uh, we have made it a point to minimize rolling our own, especially on the airplane end, anywhere we can. We're trying to work with COTS components. That way, if we lose one, it's a simple matter of going online and getting replacement parts and we're back in business within a matter of days. Um, we used to roll our own vehicles, and the problem was something goes wrong, and now you're offline for a month or two while you're trying to debug and repair your only vehicle or your specialized vehicle. So we've decided that we're going to try to use COTS wherever we can at this end, and we do all of our special stuff on the ground station so that we can protect that and carry it from mission to mission. On the software side, we're using OpenCV for a lot of our imaging work. Um, we run uh, Linux on the ground. There's a real-time Linux running inside. Uh, the PixHawk, which you can program, you can get all the source code, even the diagrams. Uh, the, the, the group that made this is in Switzerland. Um, and you can buy either the PixHawk from 3D Robotics or the, uh, it's called the PX4, is the original one. And uh, you can download anything you want. You can get the source code for it. You can hack this any way you, could, you feel like it. It's really convenient. And the protocol to talk between the two is um, called um, Madlink. Thank you. I was going to say Mavros, but that's the Ross layer. But I'm the Madlink. So, and you can't really see, but that's a sample of the, the ground control default software you can download for free um, from the Mavlink folks or from the RG Pilot folks. And um, that is a great one to monitor the health of your system because it's got it all built into it. And it has a graphical user interface to command waypoints and things, which is great for training up the students. But when you're on a ship, it doesn't work so well. So we just use it to monitor. And we write our own software to send information up to the robot. Uh, so current capabilities, we do have autonomous launch running. We have autonomous landing running. Um, we have uh, what's called follow me mode in the software. We've adapted it. Where uh, the issue is, if you use, the, this is why we don't use DJI's uh, equipment. The default state for most people using one of these vehicles is, you know, I set up where I want to go do my business, and I, I establish my home position, and I take off and I do what I want to do. I film, I fly, and whatever. And when I say come home, I come home to where I started. On a ship at sea, that means you're going to come home to where you were 15 minutes ago, which is not good for the robot. So it tries, as it tries to land in a piece of ocean you left behind. So we have adapted the follow me into our landing mode, where we basically say, we want you to follow me lower and lower and lower. And the follow me is gained 
so that the robot is actually following the landing point we want it to be on the ship, and eventually we get it to come into the low enough altitude that it effectively lands. And then we're working with, uh, with Ocean Alliance on, we're trying infrared, which is pretty nice because the infrared, the whale blow shows up really well in infrared. So we did some testing last mm -hmm. summer in the Gulf of Mexico. FLIR loaned us two of their small cameras and one of their top of the line, almost military grade, wonderful infrared cameras. Um, which we wasted a lot of time starting at low rays at sea because they really show up well in infrared. <laughs> um, and then we're doing image analysis of whales at sea and trying a bunch of things. Um, it's a, it's a, going to be a long time. It's a lot of stuff to solve there. So now, unexpected. We <clears throat> created the snot shot, of which I brought a piece of the snot shot. The unexpected need. Noah, who runs the fisheries department, um, who give, issues the licenses to approach whales, and there's only three groups in the country that have a license to approach a whale to take a sample. Scripps, Ocean Alliance, and Woods Hole. And they have to renew their license on a year-by-year -year basis, and they have to be very explicit with what they're going to do in order to get permission. So they said, um, let me make sure I get the questions right. They asked us, do whales hear multi-rotors? Do whales notice downwash? Um, will it bother them? And Ocean Alliance asked us, um, What's the best method of collecting blow? Where's the best place to put the sponges to get the blow that we want to get? So we built Snotshot in response to that. Snotshot is our artificial whale head, which doesn't look at all like it. I'll show you a picture. But it's a set of plumbing. It's PVC pipe, valves, pressure, uh, pressurized air, and water. It also has two hydrophones, two anemometers, and a, long, and a firing sensor, which I did bring. And what happens is you fly over Snotshot. This is attached to snot shot and is wired into the valves. <clears throat> you fly over snot shot. Snot shot logs the acoustic signature at the surface and three meters down. It also logs uh, on two planes uh, the anemometer readings. And when the vehicle flies over the uh, acoustic sensor at the right altitude, it fires off the light and fires the valve. So we know we got a good shot from a distance. What's an anemometer? A uh, wind speed sensor. So that way we can measure the downwash. Um, so we have them at two angles so that we can also measure the ambient winds and compare that. Um, How so, close are you flying to the surface? I mean, downwash should be trivial after um, maybe 20 rotor lengths? That's what I'm expecting, and, but we have to prove it to <coughs> Okay. So we're, being, we're collecting everything, even stuff that it, it would be faster to just show them the numbers and explain it to them. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. Um, so we did that in the Gulf of Mexico last summer. We flew over our snot shot. Um, we may or may not have flown over whales. No one can verify or deny whether or not we did, but we did fly over <laughs> Snotshot, and we collected a lot of samples and a lot of good acoustic information and a lot of good uh, anemometer information. We showed that the vehicle was, uh, the downwash was in the noise level. The ambient wind conditions completely wiped out any trace of the downwash, which is what we expected. And we also showed that there is a measurable acoustic signal from the rotors in a frequency band that whales are known to not care about from other testing. I forget the exact frequency now, but it was out of the band that the whales look at. So High, Was it a higher frequency sound? Yeah, it was up higher than, than what they care about. So <clears> we're <throat> pretty sure that the whales just don't care. So when, so that there's a maximum <clears throat> frequency, like with humans. They, so they don't, they don't have a band that they don't listen to and then another band above that. No, okay. no, they generally, they have a, it's a, it's a, really it's a, it's a, on the whole, it's a narrower band than humans have. It's mm -hmm. a different position, but it's, it's not as broad as what humans do. Um, but it's, uh, we have shown that um, we have shown conclusively that downwash is not an issue, no question. One could argue that okay, it's not in the bands that we think whales care about, but they've never heard this before. How do we know they're not going to get pissed off? And our answer to them is, well, we've got the baseline data. We'll go and collect samples, and one of the things you get from collecting from a whale is, is a hormonal information, including a stress hormone. So what we can do is we can collect hormone information from whales and fly over them multiple <clears throat> times and see if there's a change in the hormone levels. And if there's no change in the hormone level, then the whale didn't care. It's not, it's not freaking out. So what's and, the primary sound you're hearing? Is it the, the, the high pitch of the ESCs, the, the PW on the ESCs, or no, is it the, the rotor, the rotor sound itself? Yeah, the rotor sound itself. Mm -hmm. So you could just switch to larger rotors and, and thus yeah. have a, a smaller impact. You can, yeah, I guess, if they, actually, maybe the smaller rotors get the frequency up the away speed. from the band the whales care about. They tend to like the lower frequencies. Mm -hmm. So you're sampling for something like cortisone so, yeah. release, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we think, based on preliminary analysis, we don't think the whales are going to care. Um, and there have been some semi-legal uses of drones over whales 
that uh, people around the, the country, some of which have been sued by the FAA, have collected some wonderful video. And as far as anyone can tell, the whale didn't seem to care. So we think we're okay, but they wanted a data set before they're going to let us near the whales. They did relent and let us near dolphins, which we said is great, but dolphin, the time constant of a dolphin glow, never going to happen. Not going to happen. They're up and they're gone so fast we can't react. So there's snot shot, hard to see, sorry. It's a collection of PVC pipes on a raft that we towed out in the Gulf of Mexico and off of Gloucester. And this is living attached to the side of the burrow. We uh, used an RP machine to make a bunch of different whale spout holes so we can do different shape blows. Every whale has a unique shape. Sperm whales are up and off to the side. Right whales are a, hunch of humpbacks are like a cloud and right whales do the double fork split. Uh, it comes up on both sides. So you can tell the species of whale just by seeing the shape of the whale. And then we went to the Gulf of Mexico and we got some field tests done. Hard to see, but there we are flying over snot shot. There's the boat nearby. Um, we had a lot of really good calm days, which was great for the robot, but miserable hot for the humans. Um, but it worked really well. Um, I was surprised. You really can't go anywhere in the Gulf and not see oil rigs at this point. They're just everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but we had some really good results. We saw a, I think it was called a bride's beaked whale, if I remember right. There's only 36 of them in the world. Mm -hmm. And we saw one. And we thought that was like the most awesome thing ever. You know, like, so we, could, we didn't get any samples from it, but we did get some photographs so we could log the position and the size of it. So next steps. We're trying to improve the robot. We're going to design our own chassis at long last, um, but we're designing something that's really easy to maintain. So an external frame, a tube down the middle with all the electronics in it, and one mount point between the two. So we can swap out the frame or the tube as needed. And all the electronics live on, a, on a, an endoskeleton inside the tube. So you slide the electronics into the tube, you attach the tube to the frame, you're in business. If you break an arm on the rotor, not a problem. Um, you just swap out the frame. If you have something cracks in the tube, not a problem. You slide the electronics out and slide in a new one. We're just using carbon fiber tubes, RP parts, and back deforming, trying to keep the cost and the ability to make a lot of spare parts as simple as we can. Um, and we are working on, uh, we have a, um, a robot boat that we've been playing with that we're going to start to practice launching and recovering with the robot boat. That's less to help the whale people and more to help the oyster people. They would like a boat and an air vehicle stationed um, on shore at some place like Boston Harbor or Wellfleet, and then right after a major weather event, they want to collect water samples before things calm down, and then hold the samples for later analysis, because they're trying to figure out what the oysters like and what the oysters hate. So having a robot boat that goes out in January after a storm is much preferable to a graduate in biology that gets to go out in the storm right after. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, how does a drone, what samples do you collect with a drone over, over oysters? Um, they want water space. samples. They were asking for a liter. We said, how about a quarter cup? Yeah. Uh, so the boat will probably do most of the collecting. Well, the air vehicle will just do photographic surveys. Oh, okay. So you, um, unless they can live with smaller samples, that's all they can get. Are you getting mm -hmm. samples from like the face of the bed, or are you getting water columns? They'd like the whole water column if they could. We haven't got the boat ready to collect the samples, but they're 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 starting with everything. We want everything. We want it all right. the time. Of we course. Want it now. Yeah, yeah. Why would you consider a drone <laughs> for getting samples of the water? Um, the flying drone? Yeah. Because uh, the oysters can live in salt marsh areas. They get into very shallow areas where the boat can't go. Uh -huh. So if we could dip and grab a small sample and bring it back. The, the reason it came up was they had put in a, um, so now I'll do a side thing about oysters. So they want to put oysters back off the coast of uh, pretty much all of North America. And there are four good reasons you want to do this. The first one is oysters taste good. All right, everybody knows that. This, unless you hate oysters. Um, the second reason is when uh, oysters are filter feeders. Um, a one oyster will filter, I forget, I think it's like 50 gallons a day or some insane amount like that, one oyster. So, and there are videos you can actually see side by side like two tanks and one just goes completely clear in a matter of minutes that has the oysters in it. By filter feeding, they not only clarify the water, which allows grasses to grow on the bottom, which allows small fish to find places to hide, which allows big fish to come back to eat the small fish, which brings your fisheries back. Also, when they filter all that stuff out of the water, they build their shells with it which includes the pollutants in the water column. So it all gets locked out of the water column and locked into the shell of the oyster and left on the bottom as other oysters build up on top of the reef. So it's a way to lock down the pollutants that are floating in the food chain. It pulls them out. And then finally, when you have a big storm and it hits an oyster reef, the oyster reef breaks up the waves, prevents coastal erosion, and when the reef gets trashed, it grows itself back. You don't have to spend a billion dollars rebuilding the seawall. It'll build itself back, just leave it alone. So they tried this in um, uh, Chesapeake Bay, and it was working great, so they're expanding the program. So they put a batch in at Wellfleet Harbor um, 
which is known for its oysters anyway, about four years ago. And they saw a 70% reduction in um, runoff pollutants, uh, nitrates and fertilizer. And the beaches went from scummy black to sandy and golden again. And everything was going great. And then in year four, three quarters of the reef died off. And nobody has the first idea why. Mm -hmm. Whatever happened was so transient that the biologists didn't catch it. And that's when they approached us and said, can you do something? We would like something that we could deploy at a moment's notice after anything we consider an event and get us some water samples so that if it happens again, we can point to what killed the oysters because they don't know. So we said, okay, so that's what we're going to work on next. So that's all I've got except for a couple of videos if you want to see them. And I brought robots, lots of robots. Uh, this one we named Sunny for the obvious color reasons. Also because it's named after Patrick Stewart's wife because Patrick Stewart likes Snotbot. He saw our video and he actually sent a check to Ocean Alliance and said, keep up the good work. <laughs> so as soon as we heard that he sent a check, we promptly renamed the robot after his wife. So this is Sunny. Uh, Sunny was our great hope because we could put the battery inside. There was a camera mount point. We can put a, uh, another camera underneath. I broke the legs, so I have gloves right now. Completely watertight, wonderful robot. However, if it lands hard and breaks an arm, it is nearly impossible to repair. It can be done, but it is a lot of heavy lifting. In the field or at so, all? So in the field or back in the lab. It's just a pain in the butt. Is it all carbon, very thin short carbon fiber? Yeah, and there's, there's carbon, carbon fiber and fiberglass, there. yeah. So Sunny's been relegated. Sunny is um, <clears throat> Sunny's our fashion model. When we're doing photo shoots, we, roll, so we fly Sunny. <laughs> so when, when the press shows up, Sunny gets all the press. Sunny doesn't do any of the science. So, so did you manufacture that frame? Where did no, it this is a group in England that made that for us. Hmm. Um, um, and they're sending me a replacement part. Really nice guys. Um, it's a wonderful vehicle. It flies great. Uh, rock solid. Uh, but if we ever break it on the ship, we're dead in the water. The aquacopter people make these things, which are indestructible. You could, you could probably bludgeon someone to death with this and nothing would happen. It is just the, most, <laughs> it's just the strongest bloody thing I've ever felt. And then for the students, Mostly, I have them flying basic um, uh, DJI flame wheels with uh, Pixhawk on it because they're easy to service, they're easy to access all the parts and debug. And we're flying around the campus, and the campus is in Needham, so we're not in the ocean. So this works great. And then we can port the code over to the other robots for field testing. So this one flies really well. I'm very happy with it. Uh, did I bring? That was all the robots I brought. What so. are the weather limitations to which one of the multi auto? Hmm? What are the weather limitations to each one of the multi-autons? Um, none of them have a great runtime. That's our real killer. Um, mm -hmm. The sealed ones tend to overheat in the summer sun, so they have shorter run times as a result. Uh, it mm -hmm. tends to overheat the speed controls. We tried using some, uh, some fins, cooling fins on this, but we never found a good way to thermally couple the speed controls of these fins. Um, not without taking off the protective insulating wrapper around the speed control. Where, where do the speed controls sit? In that. Right now they're sitting at the bottom, oh, okay. and the battery sits back here, mm -hmm. and then the rest of the electronics are up here. That's the GPS antenna. That's a pressure uh, tube so that the, the, anima, the altimeter will continue to function. Is that uh, in an open port to the environment? So this one is, yeah. Okay. But it's got a co it's got a, a coil like a you know like a, a U bend equivalent to prevent water from getting at it. Um, and we had a second antenna mounted underneath for a while for a, a different transmitter. What's that black thing at the bottom? So that's just a GoPro mount. We were, we were playing around in Savin Hill Cove with this and a GoPro for a while. And it worked out okay. Um, we're like in a run down that you're getting? So, 15 minutes pretty much is the best we can do. Which, which what things are you? Uh, we're using um, three cell. Um, we ha we've got mostly 37 and 4,000s, and now we're starting to get some 5,000s in it. That looks like somebody didn't put all the screws back. I thought about using fixed wings. I mean, based on what you described, it, it sounds to me like, I mean, multi rotors are great for simplicity mm -hmm. and, and students can trash yep. in the lab and they don't, don't break nothing. But it sounds like your task might be better solved by, by two fixed wings, one that orbits so that when the whale surfaces, the battle just goes there. You have a GPS coordinate, continues to orbit, and the other one just dives through at high speed. We're going to use a fixed wing for survey work. Uh, mm -hmm. I have. Um, We've been asked to come down. Ocean Alliance every winter sends a team down to Argentina. There's this one cove um, where uh, I think it's humpbacks winter and have their calves. And then they come back north again in the spring. So they're down there around November through February time frame. And every year for 49 years now, Ocean Alliance has done a flyover photographic survey of the population. And that's how they keep track of, of the population growth or decay rate. 
Um, and every year the Argentinian Air Force loans the aircraft to the pilot, but Ocean Alliance has to pay for the fuel and the photographer. It sets them back about $50,000 every summer to do this. So they have asked, could we please come up with an air vehicle that can do it for them? So I looked at the, uh, at the situation and decided, well, there's no airstrip. We need something with a fairly long range in order to, to get a big enough survey at, uh, at one time. So what we decided to go with was a flying boat because we have lots of water to take off and land on, so that makes it easy. So then I went looking for a flying boat that would be appropriate for a heavy payload with a camera and the extra fuel, and I found the Canadair 415, which is a water bomber, and it's designed to carry heavy loads and launch and land on the water. It has a wonderful under-cambered wing with lots of lift, and it will fly relatively slow and carry a big load. So perfect for a photography platform. How big is this thing? Um, well, the real one is a monster. But there's two different models you can buy. One is a foamy with about, a, I think it's about five feet, wingtip to wingtip. We have two of those with electric motors to practice. And we also bought two, um, two skin and frame models with nine-foot wingspans. And they're designed to run on a gas engine. And so I promised the students that when they prove to me they can successfully take off and land on Lake Wabin without killing the foamy, <laughs> then they're allowed to port it over to the big one, and we'll try it again with the big one. Mm. But I've only got two, and I'm not going to let them waste it. I'm going to let them wreck the foamies as much as possible before I let them touch the good stuff. How long can a fixed wing, wing foamy fly for? Uh, that one would easily get a half an hour. Uh, throttle back and loiter, and, and we haven't even crammed it full of batteries yet. Um, is that's batteries? Yeah. Does, does the back plane makes three hours. Oh, that's great. Why? That's great. What's the wingspan on that? Uh, it's, it's a high aspect ratio. Okay. <coughs> so it's, I think, 2.8 meters. Nice. Yeah. So, so all up weight. the back plane. You're the back copter, and then out the back plane. So. Well, we, we totally have to have snap out the back plane. I yeah. think that's just. <laughs> 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 that's just